Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Purdue. I am the infrastructure nerd, and you are attending our September Coffee Pot webinar. And this month, our topic is using Practice Master Contacts for marketing and CRM. And for those of you who are wondering what CRM means, at least the way I understand it, it means customer relationship management or client relationship management. We are going to talk about those subjects, which happen to be my favorite subjects to talk about. But first, a little bit of housekeeping, if you will. This is the GoToWebinar control panel. Many of you that have already attended these sessions in the past know that if you click this button right here, it will cause this to go away. This button, of course, looking like arrows pointing to the right, meaning we're going to shove this thing over to the right and get it out of the way. When you do that, these buttons here will still remain flush right against your screen. And this will change into a button that looks like arrows pointing to the left. Clicking it again will cause this to come back into focus. If you want to ask a question and you don't want to ask it live, you will want to bring this into focus and type your question right here and be sure to send with the send button. When you send a question, it will go to our humble and wonderful moderator, Leanne, who will interrupt me at an appropriate and opportune time, ask your question on your behalf, and we'll make sure that it gets answered. In other words, if you have follow-up questions as I'm talking with the answer, just type them very quickly. Hit send, of course, and Leanne will keep asking your questions on your behalf until we've got everything answered. If you're feeling a little bit less shy, you can also hit this button here that looks like a hand with an arrow pointing upward in front of it, which means, of course, raise your hand. Leanne will still interrupt me at an opportune and, 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 and correct time, uh, but when she interrupts me, instead of asking your question, she will simply unmute you and let you ask it yourself. So if you have questions, raise your hand or type your questions here. And without any further ado, ado, do or ado, we will go on and talk about using contacts for marketing in Practice Master. Uh, of course, that begins here in the contact screen. I know that may seem obvious, but we're going to cover all the bases here. And I'm going to choose Adam Field, and I'm going to click on this mailing list info tab. Now, of course, this tab can be called whatever you want. Uh, a lot of our clients will call it marketing info or CRM or whatever you want. But here's the premise. In Practice Master, you've got a place to put your contacts. Many of you are doing that. And many of you are using this contact file, if you will, in Practice Master to tag contacts to matters. You know, you want to know that this guy is the opposing attorney on this matter and the opposing attorney on that matter. Uh, many of you are using contacts to populate your Outlook contacts list so that you can then push those contacts through to your smartphones. Uh, of course, Practice Master, if you're using tabs, is integrating with tabs, so those contacts are available to turn into clients. So it makes sense that this is where you should be doing your marketing. It makes sense from a number of different perspectives. First and foremost being, Practice Master is really a relational database program. Um, I know that's nerd talk, but what it means is we, or you, can go in and change the field structure and add fields and take fields out, but more appropriately add fields to do the things you want to do in marketing. That's what we've done here. We've added a whole bunch of fields, and we are using them to market. Now, I'm going to address these three areas one by one and then talk a little bit about this special field here. You have two types of marketing that you do. And some people have both. Uh, some people only have one. But these things I like to call tangibles. These are things that you do. You send out a Christmas card. You send out large and small tins of popcorn at Christmas. Maybe you send out poinsettias. Maybe you have a Thanksgiving card. Maybe you have a, a group of people that you send announcements to when one of the lawyers achieves some uh, fame and you want to let people know about that. Uh, maybe you have newsletters that go out on a regular basis. Uh, this particular firm has a, an estate planning letter. I have another firm that has uh, a workers' comp 
guidebook that they send out every year. It's not really a, I suppose it's a marketing opportunity. They're using the marketing information to uh, a screen to do that. Uh, this firm here likes to uh, uh, approach women that are active in business, and they have a special marketing focus specifically on women in business. Uh, these are tangible things. They happen. You send the card. You have the party. You have the open house. They're tangible. These are intangible, and as you'll recognize, they are basically areas of practice, areas of interest, things about law that certain of your clients or prospects may be interested in. Now, that word right there, prospects, is the key to why Practice Master's Contact File is the perfect place to be doing your marketing. If you're going to invite a judge to your Christmas party, I'm pretty sure the judge is probably not a client. Maybe he is, but it's probably a long shot that he would be or she would be. And therefore, you can't do your marketing from your client file because a lot of the people that you're marketing to, inherently the name marketing implies that you're dealing with people that have not yet become clients. So it's important to recognize that uh, the old school was that we'd put all this information in the client file, but that doesn't really make sense because most of the people that you're marketing to are not clients. So these are areas of interest that those people could have. And the reason we do these separately is so that you can define a whole broad spectrum of things that people might be interested in, whether or not you're ever going to do anything with it. And the reason I say that is a lot of firms use this intangible or this area of interest based uh, designation on a contact by contact basis so that in case something happens relating to bad faith defense that's very important and affects your clients or affects your prospects, um, you want to very quickly be able to get information out to the 107 people that you have in your contact list of 15,000 people that has this information. So these are intangibles. It doesn't mean we always or on a scheduled or regular basis send information on bad faith defense, but we have the ability by identifying people's area of interest to do that at will. Now, the other part of this screen, we'll go over this in a second. We'll talk about what these things mean. The other part of this screen is the source, the marketing source. Who in the firm cares about marketing to this person, and this person being Adam J. Field? That's who we're looking at. The, uh, the gist here is that you want to be able to print a list at the appropriate time that tells each attorney or each person that may have people that they market to who you're sending the holiday cards to, who you're inviting to the Christmas party, and you want to be able to show that attorney or that person only their list. So by identifying who you're sending, who, who's responsible for sending this guy the Christmas card, or who's responsible for inviting this guy to the open house, or who's responsible for sending a newsletter to this guy, you're able then to print a list that says, here's the people that we're going to send to a, a holiday card to this year on your behalf. And here's yours, and here's yours, and here's yours. And you're able to identify who cares. Now, many of you know that back on this screen, it's called user group out of the box, and a lot of times we change it to, say, phone sync. There's this other field. And this field identifies, and we change it to phone sync because that's really what it's used for. This field identifies that we want Adam J. Field to sync with Paul Purdue's phone. And so we select Paul Purdue, or PEP, that's my initials, here, and that means this guy will sync with my phone. Then over here, we can also say that PEP is responsible for this person from a marketing standpoint. Now, what's the difference? Well, let's say that me, Paul Purdue, I know Adam Field, but I think he's a real jerk. So I don't want his phone number and his address on my phone. I'm never going to contact him. But he's an important jerk. He's somebody that is very influential, uh, holds a position that, that makes us want to court him from a marketing standpoint. So it's important to be able to distinguish the fact that, yes, I want to send him a Christmas card, but no, I do not want him on my phone. And so that's, that's the answer to that question. That's why we have a separate place to identify the marketing responsibility for this particular person.
So let's say we want to send a Thanksgiving card to Adam J. Field. I simply check this box. And if I need to, I can say we're going to send it to his home, even though the business address is the default address. And instead of sending it to Adam J. Field, we want to send it to Adam and Betty Field. That's what these fields are. These are address overrides and name overrides. You don't always send the holiday card to the exact name that you have in the contact system. But of course, you need that exact name in the contact system so you know that his name is Adam J. Field. But when you send the card, you're going to send it to Adam and Betty Field. Or maybe he's a doctor, and so you're, you're sending it to his, his office. You might instead put Dr. Field and staff. Now, if that were the case, we probably wouldn't send it to the home address, We'd send it to the business address. But the point is, when we have these overrides, we're able to say, yeah, we know that his name's Adam J. Field, but we're going to send the card specifically to Dr. Field and staff. And yes, we know that his home address is his default address, but business is what we want to do. And so when we save this, he's ready to go. And now if I were to print the report to do the Thanksgiving cards, or should I say create the Excel file, uh, he's going to be in there. He's going to be specifically tagged to me so that I can approve him and say, yep, we still want to send him a card this year. It's going to automatically know to pull that address and to address it to this name, not what we have on file. It's as simple as that. Now, if we take this off, and get these things out of here real quick, and I'm going to save this. I want to show you that if we check this and we don't put something here and save it, I'm going to hit the Save button, we've written Workflow. And the Workflow assures that it's going to go to the default address and to the default name. Now, for those that are nerdy enough to care, the reason we did this, when we originally started doing this for clients, and we've done it for quite a few now, when we originally started doing this, we thought, oh, aren't, aren't I smart? I know that we need to have an address override and a name override, and, and sometimes they'll be filled in and sometimes they won't. And we'll have the report have very complex logic, because again, aren't I smart, that will help us to decide whether or not we need to use this name here or whether we can just pull the one from here. And then being uh, uh, maybe too smart for myself, I, I, I realized that's a lot of work for that report to do. And instead, with the new workflow feature that's available in version 16 and higher, uh, we can simply automatically pump in the correct information here. So what that means is that when we check it, if we didn't put something in either of these two fields, it'll go out and get it. And then the report doesn't have to be that smart. The report doesn't have to have all that logic. And the report doesn't have to be so complicated that we are the only ones that can change it. Uh, it, by eliminating a lot of that logic, it makes it easier for other people to go in, edit that report, or make a small change to it. The other reason was that people didn't understand what these fields were. And rather than spend a lot of time training people and explaining it and have something that we had to explain over and over again as people started putting people into this, you know, checking boxes off, we simply decided that it was better from a user perspective if it filled that in if they didn't. And then they'd say, oh, yeah, that's who it's going to be sent to. And they kind of understand that. People tend to understand when they check the box and they save it. And it puts in the name that, yeah, OK, I get it. That's who it's going to go to. Um, and I might be able to change that because obviously the, the field is here and the drop down is here for me to change this. So it made it easier for people to understand. And it made it easier for the report to be coded and for the data to be worked with. Now, similarly, when we uncheck this and then save it, it goes out and clears that field. Because we don't want anything in here if it's not checked. And we do want something in here at all times if it is checked, even if the user didn't specify an override. Now, um, what we end up with then is a report. And the report simply pulls, and I'm pretty sure I have this report here. It's, let's see here, marketing. Well, maybe I don't have this report. Um, but what the report does is it allows us to go out, specify what we're pulling. 
maybe this time we're going to do an announcement. Maybe the next time we're going to invite people to the party or we're going to print the Thanksgiving cards. It pulls all the people that have whatever checkbox we select checked and pulls the appropriate address and name into a spreadsheet where you basically have name, address, city, state, zip, company name if appropriate, and uh, breaks it down in such a way that that spreadsheet can then be kind of sorted and grouped by attorney or whoever is responsible for marketing. And you know, here's Bob's list, here's Phil's list, here's, here's Mary, Mary Ellen's list. And that allows us, we can print that as many times as we want, we can come in and make changes and reprint it. So we can take these lists, get them into a spreadsheet, distribute them to the proper people, Have say, here's your list of Christmas cards that are going to go out this year for you. Uh, anybody you want to add, anybody you want to take off, any, any changes that you know of. Any changes, any additions, any deletions, we simply come in, make the appropriate changes. If somebody isn't going to get the card this year, we uncheck them. If somebody new is, we find them in the system or add them into the contact system and check that box. If there's a change, we simply make the change, and then we reprint the list. Perhaps we reprint it to go out to the attorneys for a final review. Perhaps we don't. But then we end up with a list, an Excel spreadsheet, that can be used for anything. It can be sent to a mailing house. It can be merged with labels to be applied to an envelope. It can be merged with envelope documents to have the address printed directly on the envelope. It could be incorporated into a letter. Anything you want to do. At that point, you're working with an Excel spreadsheet that has each row containing a name that you're marketing to. And of course, anybody that is doing marketing knows that Excel spreadsheets are the way to work with that data. Leanne, you have a question? Yes, David has a question. And it is, how do I enable the mailing list info tab in Practice Master? Ah, that's a good question. There is no mailing list info tab. We designed this for you. If you're going to, just a quick primer, if you will, on how Practice Master works. If we go into File Maintenance and look at the contact file, we added the fields that we needed, list type, address overrides, areas of interest. Once we added those, we went into the Form Designer, and of course this is kind of skating over some very technical information. And we went into the form designer and we added this tab, called it what we wanted to, added the fields to it, and organized them the way we wanted it. So it's not something that, that, that you just flip a switch and it's there, mainly because these things vary from firm to firm. Uh, one of our clients has a uh, at the holidays, they send out large and small tins of popcorn. So for their system, we have a, and a way to identify that. And we have a little drop down over here that lets them identify whether this guy would gets a large tin or a small tin, whether he's a, a good client or a kind of good client. Um, some firms have, of course, different areas of interest. So uh, and, and usually, they're not quite this long. This particular list goes on. I believe it has 32 different areas of interest. Um, so some firms uh, don't care about who's responsible. They just print a, a general list and distribute it to everyone and say, here's the Christmas cards we're sending out. Look at it. See if you want to. Uh, uh, in a larger firm, it makes sense to break it down by who's responsible and give a personal list that includes only their clients or only the people that they're caring about. In a smaller firm, it's really just a matter, usually, of printing a, a list that everybody looks at and kind of passes around, or you print a separate list for everybody. Uh, so no, there is no place to go. It's it's kind of a personal thing. It's kind of a customized firm by firm thing. Now you do have the capability to do this if you're nerdy enough or have the inclination. You can come in. I'm kind of showing you the concepts behind, you know, putting in a checkbox and a drop down and a field to hold the the indication that they get this marketing info. The fact that we need to specify which address it goes to and the field to hold the alternate name, um, but. Uh, we can also help you with it. We've done it for many, many people, and so we've gotten to be pretty good at it, pretty quick at being able to do this. Uh, any more questions for now, Ann? No questions right now. OK. Now, one field that I think is very important, and, and people always say, well, why do, you, why do you need a never mail field? You know, If the guy's on the, the list to get the Thanksgiving card and, and you take him off the list, then you're not going to send him a Thanksgiving card. 
Never mail is a visual indication to anybody that may come in after someone is removed from a list that says, this guy shouldn't be on a list. Let's say that uh, Adam J. Field is a, uh, a client, a former client that had a fee dispute with the firm, and sued the firm, and, 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 and it was a messy battle over you know, uh, us potentially being incompetent and, and charging too much money, whatever. He, he, he made us mad. And we're not going to send him any more Thanksgiving cards. He certainly doesn't get invited to the party anymore. We basically are not marketing to this guy anymore. So if I come along and uncheck all the things that we were doing, and I don't have any way to indicate that we should never, ever mail to him again, somebody else could come in later. Maybe we have a new equity partner, a new of counsel that comes into the firm and says, oh, I know Adam Field. We should be sending him a Thanksgiving card. Without this visual indication, we don't have anything to tell us that Adam Field should not be marketed to. So that's just a matter of, of, of what we're doing there. One other interesting thing that I have a client in Cleveland that, that uses this for, they have tickets. They have tickets to the Cavs games. They have tickets to the uh, a series of uh, a plays in, in, the, in the theater district. And they have a golf membership. So we have added a little section over here. I'll just describe it to you where you can indicate with a checkbox that this person has an interest in basketball, theater, or golf. And then there's next to each checkbox, there's the ability to indicate the last time that you gave them tickets or invited them to go golfing. Uh, and with this information being stored, this client can pull up a very quick report um, based on what it is that they have tickets coming up that they haven't used. So they say, oh, we got tickets to the Cavs game next Friday, and no one's using them. Uh, let's find somebody to give them to. They run this report specifically for basketball. You can specify basketball or theater or golf. And it shows them a list uh, printed in uh, date order based on last uh, time this person was invited. And, and they go down and they look at people that haven't been invited to go to the Cavs games or to, to take the tickets to the Cavs games in quite a while, and they they call them up until they find somebody. That particular report will list the person, uh, the date that they were last invited, and any appropriate contact information, either uh, email address or telephone number. And usually what they're doing is they're simply going through that list right on the screen until they find somebody to take the tickets. So there's really a lot of room for imagination here. Um, that client is the only one currently that's using it for uh, season tickets to, to sporting events or to theaters. Uh, or to, to golf memberships or that sort of thing. But we have a couple others that are considering doing that right now. Do you have another question, Leanne? OK. Um, very good. Now, one thing that's also new that I want to show you, I'm going to go sneak over to my system. This is Attorney Computer Systems Practice Master. This is a record for my brother Dave, who happens to be a patent attorney. We do a lot of marketing by email. As most of you know, you were invited by email to attend this webinar. And we announced the topic, I believe, on Tuesday with an email that went out. We use a service called MailChimp. We've used a constant contact. We did use a, a program called SendBlaster to send them ourselves. And most recently, we've moved to MailChimp. MailChimp, we found, in case anybody cares, to be the, the most robust and offer the most information. We used to try to get as much information as we could into the contact record. Uh, so if you look here, you'll see that we used to track that we sent the VUG announcements, and we sent an e announcements for webinars, and we tracked that in the notes section of Practice Master. Uh, what we discovered was, A, we're spending a lot of time to get that information into Practice Master. B, there's a lot of stuff that's available in MailChimp that is um, extremely interesting, to say the least, that we couldn't possibly keep track of. For instance, I'm going to click on Check MailChimp real quick just to show you that we can tell when things were opened and what links were clicked on. And if we wanted to, we could get down to the level of uh, uh, did they click on the picture of the video to watch it, or did they click on the text underneath? Um, and so we decided to stop trying to bring all this analytical information into Practice Master. And instead, we rely on MailChimp to show it to us, which is great. 
Now, of course, in order to get somebody into a MailChimp list, we need to go and sign into MailChimp and put in their email address and say we want to send them the tabs bug announcements or the, the webinar announcements, which is what you were sent to and re you clicked on the link to register for the web announcement for, for the webinar that we're listening to right now. Uh, at the same time, we discovered that uh, and that was also where we went to get this analytical information. And so when we started doing it uh, with MailChimp and, and learned that they had the ability to do this, we took advantage of something called their API, or their advanced programming interface. And we used one of our subcontractors to write these things here. So I can take somebody and I can add them to the Tabs 3 virtual user group meeting list and add them to the articles list and say that they should be notified about webinars and then check to see what they're signed up for, which is these, and also what their activity is. All using, these are actually workflows that live within Practice Master on the contact record. So this is a new area that we're getting into in, con uh, in contact marketing within Practice Master, which is the ability to interface what we're doing uh, in Practice Master with what we're doing here within, uh, uh, what we're doing over on the other side within MailChimp so that we don't have to leave Practice Master and sign into something else in order to get Dave signed up for those three newsletters or to check what he's been sent or received. So there you have it. You now have the whole picture. You have been exposed to how we use Practice Master from a marketing standpoint for tangible things. Uh, you've been exposed to the intangible abilities of Practice Master to track people's areas of interest, how we assign those contacts to specific attorneys for use in, uh, in tracking who's interested in marketing to whom. We also talked, we didn't see it, but we talked about using this to track marketing with things like um, season tickets and, and, and events that you want to distribute tickets or, or, or invite people to play golf or tennis or something like that based on memberships that you have. And then we snuck over to our side and looked at how we can integrate with an external mailing package. We're using MailChimp. There are other packages out there that have the same sort of API or advanced programming interface that our subcontractors have the capability to, to tie into. So that does it, unless we have any more questions that remain unanswered, Leanne? No, nope, Paul, we're all set. OK, very good. Well, everyone have a good afternoon, and uh, we will see you next month. Thanks much. Bye-bye.